Visiting rainforests and other wild destinations is always a satisfying adventure for those who, like myself, harbour an intense fascination for the natural world. But oftentimes, one need not travel quite so far to behold many of nature's exquisite curiosities, and even in the very midst of my familiar stomping grounds, intriguing little beasties are everywhere to be found including one group of animals that have been regrettably absent on my channel for quite some time. Michael Varnen, and welcome to another local adventure. Admittedly, I'm using the word adventure rather loosely here. It's really just a walk in the park. But I've run to this particular spot for a reason. All around me, beneath the logs and stumps scattered throughout the area, is a proliferation of critters, namely centipedes, and let's see if we can find some. Rotting logs are the perfect hideaway for an endless assortment of small critters, and even in a public park, just a stone's throw away from the city, one can quite readily find an entire microcosm of mini-beasts beneath a single unassuming hunk of wood. And while centipedes may have been my target on this particular venture, they weren't the only animals around worthy of some time in the spotlight. These, at first glance, might look like earthworms. They're certainly a close fit in terms of shape, size and colour, but more thorough examination of the animal's anatomy reveals a very different nature. Its body is sleek and scaly, and the occasional momentary flicker of a forked tongue betrays this diminutive creature's true identity. It's not a worm, but a typhlopid snake. Typhlopids are superbly adapted for life underground, where they prey on the ants and termites that abound in their subterranean habitat. Predictably, they are non-venomous and completely harmless to humans. It's not like you'd need a pair of lethal fangs to kill termites, after all. But harmless doesn't quite translate to defenceless. When threatened, these snakes can release an incredibly malodorous fluid, and picking one up made my hands smell like I'd been carrying a crude bouquet of stinkhorn fungi for hours. Moral of the story, save handling tiny blind snakes for the bedsheets. Stinky serpents are a fun little distraction, but it's the centipedes that I was here for and I didn't have to look too hard to find some. With its vibrant blue legs, Rysida nuda makes for a stunning sight, but it's generally unwilling to offer more than a fleeting glimpse to the curious observer, for this species is exceptionally flighty, and will more often than not vanish from sight the moment it gets disturbed. This particular individual happened to be unusually cooperative, however which gave me the rare opportunity to get up close and personal with this gem of the undergrowth. And nor is Rysida nuda the only centipede that calls the suburbs of Brisbane home. This stocky, greenish-brown centipede is the species I come across in my local area more often than any other, and what if I told you I still don't quite know what it is? Now, I'll be honest, that's been bugging me for a while. I'm the centipede guy. My channel used to be called a lair of centipedes for crying out loud, and not being able to identify my most common and familiar local species seems to be quite an indictment on my credibility. Better hope the coyote pack doesn't get a hold of that. But now those days are, hopefully, over. It's time to finally figure out what this chubby chylopod is, and we're going to do it together. Before getting into the nitty gritty science side of things, let's First, have a little bit of fun, and see what the ever-so-reliable Google Lens has to say about the identity of these centipedes. Well, the top suggestion that comes up is Scolopendra heros. So according to Dr. Google, a giant, predominantly desert-dwelling centipede native to North America, is just chilling in a park in one of Brisbane's inner-city suburbs. Yeah, I'm definitely taking that with a grain of salt. So it seems that, contrary to what 99% of commenters in bug identification groups on Facebook would have you believe, 
Google Lens isn't exactly the magnum opus of demystifying unidentified mini-beasts. And coming to a proper conclusion is a rather more tedious process that requires a few extra steps. Now, while I have not figured out what species of centipede this is, I do know that it's a member of the genus Cormocephalus, which are some of the most abundant scolopendrid centipedes here in Australia, especially where I am on the eastern coast. The only other centipede genus in my area that could possibly be confused with them is Ethmostigmus, which all possess distinctive rounded spiracles that are far larger and more pronounced than those of Cormocephalus. But narrowing this animal's identity down beyond genus level is where things get a bit trickier. Australia is host to a multitude of different Cormocephalus species, many of which overlap in range, and the likely existence of at least a few additional undescribed species muddies the waters further still. Luckily, even if the internet is by and large a turbulent cesspool of bullshit, there's a wealth of useful information out there if one only knows where to look. And here is my most vital asset in my nerdy quest to put a name to the multi-legged denizens of Brisbane City. A detailed catalogue of all described Cormocephalus species in the country, including their known distributions and their numerous diagnostic traits. And I really hope there isn't too much valuable information on the first page, because wow, a paywalled study is one thing, but Sci-Hub isn't going to help me with this. With 17 described species covered in the study, and no accompanying illustrations to use as easy references, finding a match for my local Cormocephalus seems like a daunting task. So it pays to narrow things down a little, and here, geographical distribution comes in very handy. Comparing the locality of these centipedes with the known ranges of each of the species in the publication allows me to create a short list of potential candidates. That way I can focus on the handful of species known to occur around Brisbane, and avoid wasting my time drawing comparisons with centipedes that hail from the other side of the continent. So now, instead of 17 different Cormocephalus species to choose from, I have 7. A more manageable contingent of chylopods for sure, but we still haven't arrived at a likely species level identification. In order to hone in further, we need to take a much closer look. When it comes to identifying centipedes, the antennae are always worth a thorough examination. A centipede's antennae are divided into individual bead-like segments called antennomeres, of which there are two different types. Toward the base of the antennae, closer to the centipede's head, the antennomeres have a smooth, glossy appearance. These are called the glabrous antennomeres. But if you move along the length of the antenna, You'll see that, past a certain point, the antennomeres abruptly transition from smooth and polished to looking distinctively fuzzy. These antennomeres, densely coated in minute hairs, are called hirsute antennomeres. The number of glabrous and hirsute antennomeres varies between species, and is an incredibly useful feature when identifying centipedes. Looking at our Brisbane local, we can count eight Calabrus antennomeres, with the rest being her suit. And when comparing that to the seven species on our shortlist, we can narrow things down to just two options. Cormocephalus westwardi, which has six to eight Calabrus antennomeres, and Cormocephalus aurantiipes, where they number between six and nine, with eight Calabrus antennomeres allegedly being typical for Queensland specimens, which of course fits this centipede very well. And thankfully for me, Cormocephalus westwardi is a species I'm quite well acquainted with. It's a very common sight in all the nearby rainforests I visit, and an easy one for me to recognise. One very distinct feature is the animal's disproportionately thick terminal legs, which look like they should belong to a much bigger centipede. Meanwhile, the terminal legs of our mystery Cormocephalus are comparatively slender. So, by virtue of elimination, it would seem that this centipede is most likely to be Cormocephalus aurantiipes, the final option remaining. Cormocephalus aurantiipes is perhaps the most widespread Cormocephalus species in Australia, and is quite a variable centipede as well with some populations not bearing much of a resemblance to these Brisbane locals at all. 
those further south can exhibit a vibrant red coloration. And some Cormocephalus aurantiapes from Western Australia possess blue legs. But if you know anything about centipedes, you should be pretty well aware that such variation is by and large the norm among scolopendrids, especially species with a broad geographic range. And it's a major reason for why certain features like coloration and patterning can be of limited reliability when identifying centipedes. So there we have it, finally a somewhat confident identification for the ever so common yet enigmatic centipedes that flourish in the parks and gardens of Brisbane. And it goes to show that, alluring as the far reaches of the wilderness may be, the marvel and mystery of the natural world is something that you really don't need to look too far to find. All it takes is a keen set of eyes and a modicum of childhood curiosity to turn even the blandest of neighbourhood walks into your own personal adventure riddled with ceaseless fascination and discovery. And with that, it's time to bring this video to a close. If you think these small local centipedes are interesting, then feel free to check out this video to behold some of the giants that can be found overseas. And if you'd like to see my visit to a more exciting location than just a local park, then take a look at this rainforest adventure. Thank you all for watching, and I shall see you again next time.